thank you. Can I express my huge gratitude to Dean McGowan and to the board for this opportunity? It's wonderful to be back here again. It's wonderful to uh, have the opportunity to connect with uh, friends and to uh, make uh, new friends. Um, I'm delighted that Yuta, my wife, has been able to come over on this trip too. And so we're both having a fabulous time. Um, it's been a wonderful challenge as well, stimulus, uh, delight, not to say deadline, uh, given me for this task, um, to fit into an Episcopal schedule, but I have valued that opportunity and this have been given um, some time, uh, a few months, to be able to uh, ruminate on what I wanted to see. My hope is that I share a little of the stimulation uh, that I've received by doing this, maybe some of the delight, um, for the sake of thought and conversation among us. Uh, today is the commemoration of two martyrs of the English Reformation, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, and what I'm trying to ask here is essentially how are Christians formed for sacrificial service and witness? I could have used Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley as a starting point for this, um, but I'm not going to. Uh, there are uh, three sections to what I'm going to say around the three words in the title, the three C words in the title. Um, they connect, but their connections may only be clear to me. Um, the first of them is about whose theological education. The second is about the how of theological education. And the third is a mixture of how and why. So I'm going to start, um, but not at the beginning. I want us to imagine that we're in the beginning of the third century and we're part of a small Christian community and we're living in a time of persecution. We meet weekly for prayer and fellowship and for the Eucharist. We support one another in this perilous time, strengthened by sharing our faith together in Jesus Christ. We have just gone through the process of identifying one of our number to serve as a priest with us. And we have chosen one who has recently returned from being held and tortured by the local police uh, for being a Christian. He didn't renounce his faith despite brutal torture and miraculously they released him. He's been back with us for a few months and it was quite clear to us that he should serve as a priest. The bishop held the ordination yesterday, and when he came to our candidate, he prayed over him, but he did not lay hands on him, nor did he invoke the gift of the Spirit for him. But after praying, showed him to his place among the company of assembled priests. Ordination, without laying on of hands, and even without praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit, is cited in that early third century document, the Apostolic Tradition, where we find the first complete ritual of the process of admission to the threefold order of ministry. In paragraph 10 we read, if a confessor has been in chains for the name of the Lord, hands are not imposed on him for the diaconate or the presbyterate, for he has the honor of the presbyterate by the fact of his confession. Two things are striking. First, and this is probably familiar to many of us, if not all of us, in the early church there was little way in the way of distinctive ordination preparation. Being prepared and nurtured as a Christian was the requirement for ordination. Secondly, in this specific instance, ordination is without laying on of hands. The gift of the Spirit granted at ordination had been granted to this person by his witness and endurance in persecution. And so we might conclude that character that endures suffering, born of witness, is the gift of the Spirit to the ordained. Both of these points lead me not just to this individual and his experience, but to the context in which these qualities are formed and gifts made possible. 
How would this person's Christian character, their human being, be formed so that there was no difference in preparation for ordained ministry or lay ministry in the world? How were the baptized formed so that there was no formational step to ordination? And how could that person develop as a Christian who could not merely witness to their faith, but face and endure persecution, so that when the community identified him as the one to be ordained, so he could take responsibility to build them up as the body of Christ, he was already seen as having received the necessary gifts. Well, he'd been formed as a Christian in a community of faith where all were formed to serve and witness to Christ in the world. Which gets me to where I really want to begin, which is the congregation, the community of faith, Theological education and formation is the education and formation of the whole people of God. So when I talk about realigning theological education, this is what I mean. It must be for the whole people of God, not a specialist enterprise for those called to ministerial roles. In his very helpful survey entitled The History of Theological Education, Justo Gonzalez observes that for several centuries, the theological education of the whole people of God did actually happen and took place in two particular settings, what he calls the service of the word and the catechumenate. Now I've learned enough from Dean McGowan's brilliant early Christian worship that we are actually not just talking about the service of the word here. I've also learned that I must be very careful if I want to use the word, the word worship in relation to an act of worship rather than what early Christians meant by the word, which is the core disposition of our being to live lives that are bowed before God. I've taken much from Andrew's work and tried to take it into practice in my diocese. In early Christian worship, Andrew portrays a model of second century Christian gatherings, you'll tell how carefully I've read this book, uh, that include prayer and praise, faith conversation, a meal together, and the Eucharist. This is a comprehensive Christian formation event. And I suppose we can actually say that we see this in fragmented ways in some of our current practice, where the coffee hour is part of the gathering. Or we might also see the Christian education segments before or after a service, uh, or more detached Bible study or home group sessions as part of that gathering where all of those things happen. I rather think that when we seek to add a class or a social event to an act of worship, we are responding to some deep recognition that our practice is incomplete without them. I propose we would do well as churches to recover this comprehensive approach, even as one event. For what this combines is the formation of habit and practice, the attention to Christian knowledge and understanding, the care and support of one another, the sharing of experience of living the Christian life in and for the world, the orientation in praise to God around the focal formal forming event of the Eucharist. I've tried to take this model into practice in uh, a diocesan ordination formation program that we run in St. Edmundsbury and Ipswich, as well in the way, as the way in which we shape our bishop's staff meetings and indeed to some extent diocesan synod. I'm trying to encourage congregations to explore this as they gather, to at least include an element of participative faith conversation, for that is the formational element that seems to be so crucially lacking. So in our diocesan ordination program, we gather fortnightly in an evening for three hours. This is for candidates who are in their 60s or so, um, who will serve in their local context. Those three hours are shaped around the Eucharist. We begin with the ministry of the word with a period of uh, examine using the tool of the examine, asking where we've experienced God's presence in our lives or those around us in the week or two since we met and spend time sharing and reflecting on those experiences. We move into a period of dwelling in the word, which is a form of lexio, uh, again sharing our reflections in pairs and small groups. 
One of the group then presents on a saint or season nearby in the calendar to build up a picture of those who populate our tradition. Then, because this is church, we have notices. <coughs> we move into a meal, which a couple of the group take turns preparing during or after which my colleague or I introduce a formational theme relating to the ordinal. With small group conversation and discussion, this will take an hour and a quarter, and we move into a time of intercession and peace, and then the Eucharistic prayer, sharing bread and wine before setting out into the night, and in several cases, quite a long drive home. <clears throat> the practice has been, I have to say, transf transformational for all of us. I'm keen to find ways to incorporate elements of this, at least in our main congregational gatherings, the very least trying to encourage congregations to have a period when people's experience of God in their daily lives and reflection on scripture can be shared as part of the main gathering. We need to attend to our principal gatherings to enable them at least to be occasions where people can talk about faith with one another share their experience of God in their lives, pray for one another in ways that build up the body for faithful service and witness in the world. Our gathering for worship and fellowship is the primary locus of our theological education. So let me turn to Gonzalez's second context for faith development in the early church, the catechumenate. And then I want to say something about a couple of steps I think we need to take for theological education and formation of the whole people of God today. In the early years, you know all this yourselves, in the early years, the catechumenate seems to have lasted for up to two years, followed, for example, in the case of Cyril of Jerusalem's catechetical lectures by an intense period of instruction during Lent before baptism. While individuals, particularly those becoming bishops, may have already had substantial formal education in other fields, such as rhetoric in the case of Augustine, or they quickly acquired theological instruction after election, as in the case of Ambrose, the catechumenate was the sum of the formal education of the baptized, and therefore for most of those who were ordained. We read of a few instances, instances where there are some uh, bishops who gather ordinands together for a form of preparation uh, before uh, their ordination. Um, Cyprian and Augustine are two such cases. What did seem to exist were not schools for training people for ministry, but schools for Christian learning, intended for all Christians, indeed for all who were curious about Christianity. So in the second century, we see the development of Justin Martyr's school in Rome and Clement and Origen at work in Alexandria. And recent scholarship has illuminated the way in which the ancient philosophical schools shaped the way in which the church engaged in teaching through her own schools. I remind us of this just to underline that the formation and education of the whole people of God is the foundation of theological education. What happens in our congregations is key, and perplexingly, it still seems to continue to suffer from the neglect that set in after Constantine. That a catechumenate was reduced to 80 days in Rome in 506, Pope Gregory shortened it to a further 40 days, partly because of the growth in numbers and not having enough teachers, but also because the pressure of the new Christians was reducing without persecution. It was becoming easier and safer to be a Christian, so it became less important to attend to the depth and strength of faith little chance of being ordained without the laying on of hands. I remember a conversation I had with Dan Aylshire, then the director of the Association of Theological Schools, uh, as I prepared to take up the post at Westcott. He told me that theological education in seminaries was increasingly becoming catechesis, reflecting both the reducing attention to Christian education and formation in parishes and that increasing numbers coming to seminary were quite new Christians. Now, I'm aware of the rich variety of introductory catechetical courses, most strikingly being Alpha, and the programs offering a deepening beyond the initial period of learning, such as education for ministry, as well as a host of others, often diocesan-based. But this is very patchy, 
And while I'm not advocating consistency in practice, I'd be foolish to try that across our churches, I would advocate a consistency in intention or in culture that attending to our growth as Christians needs to become foundational to the life of the church and the life of the local church. So what would I propose? The first is foolish, it's a political one, and it involves bishops. In Episcopal churches such as ours, if we are to undergo a change of culture to place the formation of the whole people of God front and center, then bishops must commit to that and work collectively and in their own contexts to enable that to begin to take hold. That, of course, is not the end of the matter, but given the energy we spend on attending to the discernment and preparation of ordinands, how about at least equal energy to the formation and education of the whole people of God? Secondly, if getting bishops to agree seems far-fetched, what, what could theological institutions like this place or the one I used to lead do? My own vision of theological education institution is that they inhabit this vocation fully to serve the whole people of God, and that they do that in two ways. First, by adopting the mindset, the idea in the mind that this is what they are for when they are engaging with those who are preparing for public ministerial roles. Keep the people of God front and center. And so think, for example, not how do we train people to lead worship, but how do we train them to build up worshiping communities? whose lives are characterized by ongoing corporate, spiritual, and theological formation. This also includes not being afraid to incorporate teaching into preaching. Augustine, after all, citing Cicero, said preaching must teach, delight, and persuade. We're glad if we manage one of those. If ordinands require catechesis, then let's take that seriously too, because it's through engaging with our own understanding of faith, deepening that understanding and reflecting on the experience of God in our lives, our prayer, our service, our witness, that we will also be able to help others to do so. Spend the first year in formation for public ministry in a catechetical process that enlivens engaged, reflective, informed, and communicable faith. The second way that theological education institutions should engage in the education for the whole people of God is directly, not just indirectly, through the training of ministers. I'm always struck that the resources of wisdom, faith, understanding, and practice are immense in these institutions. They're immense here. They were immense in Cambridge. So let's share it around. In each generation, the church has drawn on the technology around to be enterprising in her work. The early church drawing on the model of philosophical schools, Luther with the printing press. So for us today, the internet is a great gift. What would a Berkeley theological reflection on Christian witness and service via the internet for congregations look like? It's my first C, the second C, community. I've already said a fair amount about this, but I want to say some more about why I think community and formation in community is the foundation of theological education and why it's particularly needed today and why we need to engage in community formation for ministers as well as for all Christians as a lifelong process. There's no Christian life without Christian community. The primary and essential expression of the Christian life is the Christian community. We can easily rehearse biblical bases for this understanding, ranging from the community of disciples in the Gospels to the communities of Acts to the emerging ecclesiologies of the Epistles. And when we look back at the early Christian centuries, we see Augustine and Jerome and, of course, Benedict developing communities of formation, in Benedict's language, schools of prayer, which combined instruction and character formation. Of course, as Gonzalez points out, what is also gradually happening here is that the formational process that had been for the whole people of God was becoming a process for a smaller group, as the attention to the whole wanes for the reasons I've suggested. 
process of developing then intentional communities continued with the emergence of the Franciscans and the Dominicans, focusing on the importance of community life and identity. And what we also see is that while the formation of the whole people of God has been concentrated in these ways, these communities also become vehicles of revival. One example of this that had major consequences over two centuries was the brothers and sisters of the common life, which originated in the Netherlands in the 14th century. People lived in community, sharing goods, but not taking monastic vows. And these communities were instrumental in the development of vernacular scriptures, schools to educate the wider population, and of a form of devotion of reading scripture together known as devotio moderna which was itself to become transformative. These communities, these brothers and sisters of the common life, shaped Thomas Akempis, Erasmus, Luther, and the Dutch Pope Hadrian VI, as well as influenced the practices that were to be developed by the Jesuits. From these sorts of communities, we can trace the emergence of specific communities established for the formation of clergy. For the first time in the life of the church, Luther insists on formal theological study for those to be ordained. Quote, some suppose it is sufficient if the preacher can read German, but this is a dangerous delusion. <laughs> for whoever would teach another must have long practice and special ability which are achieved only after long study from youth on. And while for Luther this would take place in the university, as we see from his work at Wittenberg, in the Roman Catholic Church, seminaries as distinctive institutions began to emerge. The word was first used by Cardinal Pole, proposing this for the development of English clergy under Queen Mary, but we know that did not last, and the universities continued to perform that role in England. It was Charles Borromeo in Milan in the 1560s who set up three seminaries, and it's interesting to reflect on what he saw as the priorities and why he had three. One was to improve the quality of those already ordained, a sort of remedial and continuing program reflecting what was viewed as the poor state of clerical education to that point, but also recognizing the importance of continued development. One, with a shorter course, was for training candidates in rural parishes, a recognition, which I believe we need to embrace more wholeheartedly, that different ministries required different preparation. The third provided a full course of studies for candidates entering at 12 years of age. And what these all provided was life in community combined with university studies. Sounds very familiar. Now I want to say a little bit more about why I believe communities are so important today. I've said that I believe that formation of the whole people of God in our congregational life is foundational. Our congregations are communities of learning and forming Christian character, communities of reflection on living as Christians in daily lives, serving and witnessing in the world. These are not tightly defined communities, but have very blurred edges in our Anglican tradition. Indeed, in some cases, hardly any ed edges at all, as they weave into the warp and woof of the life of the world, serving at their best as salt or yeast or light of Christ's transforming love. History and experience, as well as theological understanding of nurturing particular gifts and calling, show that those called to serve with the core responsibility of building up the body of Christ, those to be ordained, need to be formed and sustained in ways that are both connected to and different from the communities they will serve. The formation in community, however that is expressed, is about developing character as public Christians. And that involves the formation of particular habits of prayer and life, shaping our thinking as we put on the mind of Christ and building our self-awareness and strength as we learn to love God our neighbors and ourselves. Now language is an essential dimension of such communities, not just words, but the language by which we relate to one another, by which we express meaning and value. 
So let me engage in a little philosophical foray. What we've come to call post-liberal theology is indebted to a shift in thinking which we can trace back to Wittgenstein. One of the major problems of all post-Cartesian philosophy is the tendency to put the atomistic individual at the center and to show how that individual comes to have reliably true beliefs. This is the human being reduced to mental process and isolated, I think, therefore I am. But in his later years, Wittgenstein came to reject the notion of the Cartesian individual because language, he said, is fundamental to human life. And language, by definition, and this is the point, is communal. He considers that what we become, that it considers that we become effective language users because we are enculturated in communities. His emphasis, Wittgenstein's emphasis, then is on habit forming practice in communities. And language is not just, as I said, not just words, but nuance, interpretation, connections, relationships. And we learn that by practice in a community. I won't inhabit this practice without imitating others with whom I have regular, sustained proximity. Rather than it being purely innate or a rule-shaped, given like a formula of math, Wittgenstein's emphasis is on practices that constitute tradition, and we inhabit the tradition by asking what the practices mean and how do we do them. Stanley Cavill, in The Claim of Reason, explains it in this way. In learning language, you learn not merely what the names of things are, but what a name is, not merely what the form of expression is for expressing a wish, but what expressing a wish is, not merely what the word for father is, but what a father is, not merely the word for love, but what love is. And of course, Augustine had taken us to a similar place before and expressed it in the theology which we would wish to embrace. In De Magistro, written in 389, two years after his baptism, he wrote, all we can learn through words are words, or rather, their sound and noise. For we do not learn the words that we already know, and we cannot claim to have learned those we do not know in any other way than by understanding their meaning, which does not come to us by hearing the words, but rather by the knowledge of those things they signify. We come to understand the many things that come into our mind, not by consulting the outer voice of the teacher that speaks to us, but rather by the inner consideration of the truth that reigns in the spirit. And this truth that teaches and is to be considered is Christ. Wittgenstein's focus on language and its communal and contextual nature and his recognition that reality was not apprehended through scientific abstraction had its impact on theology. He helped theology discover or rediscover that it is about the whole person and the whole person in community in relation to God. We can, interestingly, I think, trace our engagement in practical and pastoral theology, at least in part, to Wittgenstein. So to learn about being a public minister, ordained or lay, to inhabit this world, Wittgenstein says, requires being part of a community that inhabits the language. And language is about practice, regularity, familiarity, immersion, and proximity to those who use it. So if I were to take an extreme alternative to, to abstract theological formation just to a program on the internet would be a form of malpractice. Community and language in community is of course the principle that shaped those early Christian communities. Habit learning together in community, habit that shapes faith, that shapes thought and action. 
and separating out those to be formed for public ministry is not to give them an esoteric language, but to learn the ways of Christian community intensely and learn about themselves and God in that intensity for the sake of those they are called to build up as the body. After all, at the heart of these communities is not the classroom, but the prayer room. And it is there that we learn that in all things it is Christ who is our teacher. So theological education in community is at its heart about vulnerability to God, about openness to what God is doing with, among, and for us in a process that involves everyone. I would say to ordinands and I'd say to congregations, God has called you to be together and it is for you, for us, to learn and grow together, saying to ourselves not just, I'm so glad there are people here like me who like me, but I'm so glad there are people here who are very different from me, who annoy me, aggravate me, and whom I find distinctly difficult. God has brought us together for a reason. I hope I'm not naive about this. It's a tough challenge. Residential institutions in particular can take on something of the character of total institutions, as defined by Irving Goffman in his 1961 study, Asylums, where ordinands, let's not call them inmates, can respond in various ways, compliance, dissent, subversion, detachment, I'm sure that doesn't happen here. <clears throat> there are different degrees of intensity in different forms of community. Dissent and subversion are sometimes important aspects of formation partly because unlike compliance and detachment, they bear witness to some real engagement with what is happening. That said, dissent and subversion can be destructive too. So we need to make sure that there is mentoring and support that enables those engaged in ministerial formation to negotiate these four different responses, whatever their context, and to reflect on them. Now, while residential seminaries are one particular form of community, the community aspect of all theological education must be part of all those forms and engaged with intentionally and for the sake of the whole people of God. Intrinsic to all theological education is being in a community which you are sent out from and returned to. That's the dynamic of a congregation. The question is the balance of time you spend in each part and indeed how many parts there are. Therefore, it's a matter of ensuring that the time together as a community is genuinely formative and not just an educational convenience. That means attending to the granular aspects of community time. How do we engage, people engage with one another? How do we pray together? How do we share our experiences of God together, have faith conversations? How do we work together and find ourselves confronted with aspects of ourselves that maybe we have not yet faced. So, in the example of our diocesan formation program, of the fortnightly three hours together, is one where that communal formation was surprisingly effective, intense even, establishing very high levels of honesty and disclosure quickly. In fact, after this summer break we've just had, when we first met together this September, one member said he'd wondered what had been missing in his life and returning to the group made him realize what it was. Equally, in a residential community, we have to ensure that there is a continual process of being sent out and returning to a variety of different contexts, which in the case of this institution in Westcott includes overseas contexts. In the current language of contextual training, I see a residential community as engaged in multi-contextual training. Now, if community is so important to the ongoing formation of Christians in congregations and to those called to serve in public ministerial roles in formational programs, then that value does not stop at ordination or licensing. And in recent years, the practice of learning communities, that's in quotes, has started to be developed in the Church of England. A program with the unhelpful title of the Strategic Leadership Development Program has been set up comprising uh, of up to two nominees from each diocese identified by the senior staff in the diocese as having potential for taking on significantly wider responsibilities in the future. 
The programme is an ongoing process of discernment, creating space and structure for participants to listen to the call of God in their ongoing ministerial development through shared learning experiences, prayer and fellowship in community. Needless to say, the programme is not without controversy, not least because it can be seen as for the chosen ones, the ad identity of whom, this could only happen in England, is kept confidential. So, inevitably, mystique surrounds the whole enterprise. But on the positive side, this does provide a model that has the potential of being replicated for a range of cohorts within dioceses or across dioceses to create learning communities that support ongoing reflection, learning and discernment among people in similar contexts facing similar challenges. And I'm hoping that we can move to a culture where discernment for all vocation is a lifelong process, where there are longer or shorter term learning communities to support that process, and programs specific to forms of ministry, such as chaplaincy, or in Borromeo's example, rural ministry, or aspects of ministerial experience, such as team leadership or children's Christian formation, that are accessible at any point in a person's ministerial life. And the important dimension here is the formation of communities of prayer and worship, of openness and trust, in which the discernment of God's work within and among community is the heart of that community's life, whatever the focus of that community might be. Theological education, and here in particular ministerial formation, requires time and space for the informal and unstructured dimensions of a community's life, as well as the formal and structured conversation, interaction in the bar, walking to a class, engaging in sport, participating together as volunteers in a night shelter, all of these are part of a process that takes time. So my second aligning is to be fully intentional about the centrality of community in all theological education, from the congregation to the variety of forms of formation and continuing formation of public ministry. So, and much more briefly, third C, context. We may not be facing persecution, but in our current state of the world, it is not far away. And for sisters and brothers in other places, it is very present. Indeed, I was reading just this morning that religious hate crimes in the UK have increased 40% in the past year. Alarming to me is how we are allowing the demeaning and discounting of the other to become normalized, accepted behavior. We all recognize that we are in a very different context than we were a generation ago. And the formation of Christians and those who minister among them cannot operate on the same basis as it did when I was ordained 40 years ago. The picture can't be drawn simplistically, though we may find ourselves doing that at times. Charles Taylor, in his sec a secular age, asked, why was it virtually impossible not to believe in God in, say, 1500 in our Western society, while in 2000, many of us find this, not believing in God, not only easy, but even inescapable? And in answering that, he beckons us to engage in what he calls a thicker description of what is going on in what we inaccurately call the secularization of our culture. One of the shifts that has taken place is that we've, quote, this is Taylor, moved from a world in which the place of fullness was understood as un unproblematically outside of or beyond human life. Move from that to a conflicted age in which this construal is challenged by others which place it in a wide range of different ways within human life. Now, however we interpret what is happening, in the last generation or more, we recognize that the language difference has become very wide indeed in some respects though not so in others. The language of values and justice, 
for instance, provides important points of contact, but other points of connection are more explicitly religious. Surveys in the UK continue to show that people can speak of prayer, and a recent Comrades poll suggests that 62% of British adults believe some form of miracle is possible today, and that includes nearly three quarters of those aged between 18 and 24. Yet we also hear that 80% of those who go to church would not think of sharing their faith with anyone else. The response in the Church of England to this context, and I wonder if in some ways here, is anxiety and a rush to quick fixes, including in theological formation. And unfortunately, the quick fix mentality is leading to some to see ordination training as something that can be completed in a very short space of time indeed. Whether as Christians serving and witnessing in the world or ministers called to build us up for service and witness, this all does take time. Engaged time, transformative time, as part of communities of faith and formation, if we are to be able to serve and witness in our current, current context, and if necessary, endure and suffer for that. That necessity is increasing by the day in our present time. So let me conclude this realigning agenda in response to the context we are in. Alan Hirsch, the Australian missiologist, has recently argued that we should recover the first three of the five gifts of ministry in Ephesians 4. We are focused, he says, on pastors, which he called shepherds, and teachers, and neglected apostles, prophets, and evangelists. I happen to think he's wrong, at least in the English context. Our church systems and structures have focused on pastors and neglected teachers as well as all the others. We are living in times when we need to recover these other aspects of what it means to be a Christian and a Christian minister in today's world. That means about learning, about enabling others to learn, about discerning the signs of the times, about engaging in the public realm, about living and speaking the gospel in unfamiliar places and unfamiliar ways, learning to take risks and to fail often. We've begun this process in both of our contexts, but it needs, I think, to be mainstreamed. Pioneering, a popular word in the English church at the moment, is the essence of ministry if we are to reach out for healing, reconciliation and love among the people who have been entrusted to our care. But let me underline the first in that Ephesians 4 list, Apostle. We hear a great deal in the Church of England about being disciples and forming disciples. We use the language of discipleship ourselves in the diocese I serve. But disciples, if I can caricature it this way, hang around their leader to learn and to follow. But it's time, surely, to be wind-swept by the Spirit and graduate to become apostles, to be formed and reformed as those whom God is sending out to serve God's mission of healing, reconciliation, and transformation. The age of discipleship needs to become the new age of apostleship. So, first, I believe we need to think and act so that theological education is for the whole people of God and that this is the essential foundation of the formation of those called to any form of ministry. Second, we need to recognize that this happens primarily in a great array of communities centered on prayer, fellowship, and sharing, where we discover afresh God at work in our world, in each other, and in ourselves. And thirdly, we must recognize that today, God is calling us to learn, grow, and be sent out as apostles in service and witness in our disoriented world, risking much, 
encouraged by those who have gone before us, Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, and that third century community of apostles with whom I really began. Thank you.